Sorry about that. Is it back on now? Yes, sir. How did I stop it? I hit the wrong button? Probably. Okay. Well, I apologize. Thank you for pointing that out. So, can anyone tell me what statistics is, maybe? I guess we can start there. Anyone know what statistics is? Yes. Uh, remember, I want to get names. So, Hayden, correct? Like averages and percentages. Okay, so you're talking about something that is inside of a course of statistics, but I wouldn't necessarily say that that's the definition of statistics, would you? No. So Sorry, I thought you meant like what's okay, never mind. Yeah, so data, so Angel says data analysis, right? And that's again part of it, 100%, probably the largest part of it. Um, but the key word there is data. Statistics is the study of data, collecting data, analyzing data, visualizing data, using the data to make predictions. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's the point, right? Why, why do we collect data? It's to figure things out about the future. For example, a big question on everyone's minds is who's gonna win the election come November? You know, politics, people love to talk about politics or are very emphatic about politics, especially in this day and age. So you'll see posts out there saying, oh, so-and-so is leading the contender by 12 points, uh, i.e. they have a 12% lead or, you know, whatever it is, 50, 56, no, 57, 45, let's say. And how do they get that? Do they poll and ask every single person in America of voting age who they're going to vote for? I know I wasn't called, so it can't be everyone. Nobody cares about my opinion. So what do they do? How do they get this, this, these values? How do they say that so-and-so has this chance of winning versus someone else? How do they get that information from? Anyone know? Yes, Hayden again. Samples. They take a sample, right? Maybe they call or somehow poll a thousand surveys, 100% data polls and surveys or two. And we're, by the way, a large part of this class, a couple of weeks is going to be devoted to, not a couple of weeks, maybe a week, is going to be devoted to types of methods of accumulation of data. But polls and surveys are, are, are certainly two of the types, and samples in general. And then what we do is we take the information from the sample and we try to extrapolate from the sample to the overall po uh, population. For example, if I was interested in the average height of every CSUN student, anyone know how many CSUN students there are, roughly? About oh, 42,000 maybe? Something like that. Is it 48, Angel? I don't know. I, I was thinking in my head 40, and someone said 42, and you say 48. Let's say between 40 and 50,000 people. Okay, that way we're all correct, or hopefully all correct. Somewhere between 40 and 50,000 people. How long would it take to measure the height of all 50, 40 to 50,000 people at CSUN? Probably so long that half of them will have graduated by the time I'm done, and there's going to be a whole new slew of people coming in. It's not really feasible to do something like that. But what if I took the average height of everyone in this class? We have something like 50 people here. If I took the average height of everyone in this class, would that value be something that I could conclude as close to the true value or would it be way off what do you think way off you say why would it be way off i say i say so because i believe that the sample is too small okay it would require a bigger population to get a more accurate uh, result okay and to apply to something more general okay so first uh, you're, you're partially correct. I think 50 is, is large enough, by the way, just so you know. And, and we'll talk this semester about how large it has to be. But I used to believe, I used to have this opinion in my head, that a large population requires a large sample. 
And a professor of mine told me an amazing analogy to that, that kind of changed the way I, I looked at things. And the analogy is as follows. Let's say you're cooking some soup just for yourself. You're making a pot of soup just for yourself. Maybe you're going to put some of it away for later. So it's a nice size pot. If you want to test whether or not the soup is ready, what do you do? No, it's not for anyone else. So you're not worried about you know, germs and cooties or anything like that. What do you do to test whether the soup is ready? You have a spoonful. You take a spoonful, right? You put a little spoon in and mm, needs a little more of this. Now, let's say you're a caterer and you're making a huge pot of soup for a party of 500 people. Taste it, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the screen, but I see some text as well. Taste it is correct. You're making a huge pot of soup for 500 people and you want to test whether it's ready. What do you do? Do you take a larger spoon? No, you just take the same size spoon. The population is larger, but your sample size is the same size. Once the sample size is large enough, I don't need a humongous sample size as the population grows. As we're gonna learn, roughly around 30 people is usually enough to have a pretty good, uh, um, a pretty good value. In fact, I'm gonna show you right now, I'm gonna share my screen. And I wanna, actually I wanna close the check, some of it's private, not that it's, private but people are talking privately so i'm gonna share my screen here how do i oh big green share screen okay i'm okay everyone see my screen yeah everyone see my screen um yeah okay um i want to do what's it called it's called uh, central limit theorem applet and it's this one right here Okay, so we haven't learned the central limit theorem yet, so don't worry about what we're doing. This is just an analogy, okay? Let's say I have a distribution. Let's say I have a, a, a situation where the outcome, like the first one here, can be anything from the left edge of the box to the right edge of the box, and each one is equally likely. So imagine you're picking a number from 1 to 10, and any one number from 1 to 10 is equally likely. So if I were to pick a thousand numbers, I'd get roughly the, the same amount of each one, correct? Yeah? So let's do it and see what happens. Oops, let's do it and see what happens. Let's draw it. Each one of those is, so there's 30,601 um, values. And you can see between zero and 100, it's roughly equal, correct? Each one is roughly the same amount of times. Do you agree? Yes? Sure. And if I did it again, the details might be a little bit different, but again, it's roughly equal. Sure. Now, what if instead I had a situation where it's much more likely to be on the right side than it is to be on the left side? If I did that, what would I expect to see? Mm. It kind of matches, right? Uh -huh. And what if I had something like this one, very likely to be on the left, somewhat likely to be on the right and not very likely to be in the middle. If I ran 30 something thousand simulations of that, again, it would kind of match. Does that make sense? And is it people following what I'm doing here? Um, yes, no, maybe so. I was wondering if you could reiterate what this is particularly describing. I know, is sure. it saying like what the average in a population would be? Not, not exactly, we're gonna to get to that. It's saying the following, let's say, let's go back to one for a second. Or better yeah, let's go to five, okay? This is a very famous shape. Anyone know what this shape is called? Bell curve. The bell curve, okay? Let's say we're dealing with something like average height. The average height of every American. Anyone know what the average height of every American is? 5'10". Huh? 5'10". I hope not. I'm shorter than that. But I think it's something like 5'6". Huh? 5'8". Is it 5'8"? Okay, 5'8 I can handle. I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm not. 
threaten it anyway. Um, so what we have is as follows. If I go out and I measure the heights of 31,440 people, I'm going to have a significant number of them that have heights somewhere around the center. And not very many that have heights in the far left and not very many that have heights in the far right, correct? Very tall people and very short people are a lot rarer than people who live or have heights that are kind of near the average. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. So this is a population of 31,440 people, and each one of these represents uh, a possible, each, each plot on the horizontal axis is a height, and the, the, the uh, sorry, is, is, a, is a person's height, and the height of the column represents how many people had that height. So lots of people had heights near the average, and not a lot of people had heights near the sides. Okay. Now, sorry? Make sense? Now, something like number one does not really realistically represent people's heights because something like this would indicate that everyone had the same height. You'd have just as many tall people as short people as average sized people. That's not the way the world works. So this particular shape does not represent heights. But what could this shape represent? Well, what if I ask people to pick a random number between one and 100. And I asked 29,748 people to pick a random number between one and 100. If it's really random, then each number should appear roughly the same amount of times. Correct? <laughs> should answer that, but anyways. Uh, if it's really random, if it's really random, do you agree that each number should appear roughly the same amount of times? Yes, no, maybe so? Yeah. Would this shape represent a realistic scenario in that, in that situation yes. of, of picking random numbers? I would think so. Now, what if instead of picking one number, I ask you to pick two numbers randomly and average them? Would that have the same shape? If I told you to pick two numbers on, uh, at random and average them, would you think to get a very small number or a very big number? Well, to get something like one, I would need to pick two very small numbers. And to get something like 100, I would need to pick two very big numbers. Is that as likely as picking two numbers at average somewhere in the middle? What do you think? Anyone speak words, say something? I think you'd have like a bell curve type of uh, graph. Well, let's take a look at what happens with two. Certainly more bellish, right? Yeah. And if I said average of five numbers, now it's already a bell curve. I don't need 30. Even by five, it's already like a bell curve. And a shape that's like this, like, like three, which is very non-bellish, if that's a real word, by the time I hit five, it's already approaching a bell curve. And if I get all the way to 30, like I said, is usually the cutoff point for, for uh, something being a bell curve. Look at that. So my point, so even if you didn't get this, which is totally okay, the point is, is that by the time you get to a sample size of 30, usually, usually 30 is good enough to be a valid sample. That was the point of that entire exercise. We will definitely get to the central limit theorem later. So if you didn't get any of that, don't worry. We'll get it, we'll cover it later. Okay. The point is, is that 30 is, um, is, is perfectly valid and 50 even more so. Okay. Um, so statistics is the study of data, uh, collecting data, visualizing data, analyzing data, um, uh, uh, displaying data, um, predicting from data, anything you can do with data, this is what statistics is all about. Chapter <laughs> zero, sorry? Was that a whoa? I, I'm not sure what that was. I thought I heard something, okay. So chapter zero is an introductory chapter. I recommend reading it. It's like three pages long. There's not much there, um, but it's just an intro to stats. We are gonna jump directly to chapter one which is about picturing distributions with graphs. So let's all, so let's talk about chapter one. This is really where it starts. So I'm going to 
uh, uh, let's see, I actually have here something. Give me a second. Give me one second. I'm going to share my screen again. So my supervisor gave me these slides. I've never really been a slide person. I've always been a lecture person. But with this particular environment where I can't really write on the, I have a whiteboard, but it's not really the greatest. Um, I'm going to try with slides and see how that goes. And then I'm going to make these slides available to you so you have them as well. Um, but chapter one, picturing distributions with graphs. Let's get started. So in chapter one, we cover individuals and variables. What is the difference between an individual and a variable? We'll probably get to that later. So this is more like this we will cover what's not going to depth. We're going to cover categorical variables and how to display them with pie charts and bar graphs. We're going to cover quantitative variables and how to display them with histograms. We're going to interpret histograms and we're going to display quantitative variables with stem plots and then we're going to talk about time plots. So this is what we cover in chapter one. This is just a list of those things. Again, I will provide these slides so you don't have to copy word for word what they say. You will have them. But let's get started. So statistics is the science of data. And the first step in dealing with data is to organize your thinking about data. So the first uh, uh, um, key is to, to look at the difference between an individual and a variable. Individuals do not have to be people. They are the objects that you're studying. Okay, if you're interested about cars, then the objects could be cars. They could be, in this case, um, in any case, they could be people. They could be books. They could be animals, they could be trees, it could be anything. If I'm, if I'm interested in the average diameter of a tree in the Amazon rainforest, then your individuals are the trees in the Amazon rainforest. That's just your individuals for that particular study. What is the variable that we're curious about? What is the characteristic of the individual that we, that's key for this particular um, for this particular individual, they, it, it will be the diameter in my example. Uh, does that make sense so far? The difference between an individual and a variable? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's an example. Um, you have four horses. Old Indies, Storm Chief, Cattle Fires, Wind, uh, Winnier, and Coming Up Slow. Now, those are the names of the horses, not the actual horses. Um, but let's say those are the four individuals. Those are the four horses that you are studying. And what do you care about these horses? Well, you might care about the breed. You might care about the selling price. And you might care about which stable they're in. Those are variables. Those are things that change from individual to individual. That's what the word vary and variable stands for. They can change. It's not a constant, not the same in each one. There are things that change, they are variables. Does that seem reasonable and make sense? Yes? Yeah. yeah. Um, I lost, oh, I can't see, obviously I can't see text when I'm in screen sharing mode. So I'm gonna unshare every now and again, just to see if anyone's writing and nobody is. Oh, some of those are private. Uh, and then I'll start again. And next time, I will make sure that you have these in advance so I don't have to share, and you can just follow along with me. Then we don't have to worry about that. Is that okay? So next slide. When planning a study of some kind, or simply exploring data for someone else's work, here are the questions you should ask. First, who? Who are you looking at? What are the individuals that you're describing? Are they horses, like in the last example? Right? Who are the individuals or what are the individuals that we are curious about? Next is what? What are the variables? What do you care about these individuals? Do you care about their age, their color, their um, height, 
their footprints. Their, I mean, there's so many things that might vary from one to another. We don't care about anything. Uh, sorry, we don't care about everything. But those things that we do care about, that's the what. That's what you're after. Now, here's a very important thing. Depending on what it is that you're measuring, there might be a measurement, a unit of measurement that's involved. If I want to know the height of each of these horses, what might the unit of measurement be? Anyone? Feet or meters? Meters, feet. Probably won't want to use miles, although in theory I could, right? You want to use something that's you know, reasonable. Feet and meters, I think, are the best. If I was talking about something like um, how much they were bought for, assuming they were bought, what would be the units for that? Uh, currency. Some kind of currency, dollars, euros, etc. If I was curious what their eye color was, I'm not sure if horses have different eye colors like humans do. Do they? Anyone know? Do horses have different, I don't know, whatever. If I was curious about their eye color, you would just say blue or red. Not red, that doesn't make any sense. Blue or brown or whatever. Um, no units there. So not everything has units, but the ones that do must have units if they are supposed to be there. Where the context of the data collection is always important. We will definitely go into this throughout the year, throughout the semester about the where, about the when, and how they apply on a problem by problem basis. And then why? Why are we doing this study? I was teaching a class just before yours and we were analyzing the, the, uh, uh, the flip of a coin. And we flipped the coin 50 times and we saw that we had roughly 25 heads and 25 tails. And I asked my students, what do you conclude based upon the study? And they were saying things like, oh, it was 50%. They were saying things like it was 25 out of 50. And I go, I don't want math. That's not the point. I want a conclusion based upon the study. If you flip a coin 50 times and you get roughly 25 heads and 25 tails, what is your conclusion? What's the point of that? That you're just as, you have equal chances of getting either heads or tails? Yes, but why would you, why would you care? What was, the, what was the reason for doing the study in the first place to care whether there's an equal chance of getting heads or tails? What are you after? To see if it's a fair shot? To see if it's a fair coin. That's the point. Is this coin, why, why else would you be doing the study in the first place? You're investigating, is this coin fair? Does your data support the fact that the coin is fair or does the data not support the fact that the coin is fair? That's the conclusion. It's not the math part. The math part helps you get to a conclusion, but the what purpose do the data have? Why are you doing this? Does that seem reasonable, make sense? Yeah. Questions, answers, metaphors, allegories, similes, anything? So. When it comes to variables, as we're going to see, there are two types. And these two types are very different. They are, the analysis of them is different. The visualization of them is different. Pretty much everything we do with them is different. So what are those two types? You have what are called categorical variables. And you have quantitative variables. Categorical variables is when you place them into categories. Like, for example, if I was curious about the eye color of everyone in our class, some people are blue-eyed, brown-eyed, hazel-eyed. Those are categories. Five people in this category, brown. Eight people in this category, blue, and so on. There's no numbers there, right? It's not quantitative. But be very careful. Quantitative does not just mean numerical. Because I can think of certain situations of numerical values that are not quantitative, which means you can't do math with them and get answers that make sense. Can anyone think of a situation? Z zip uh, codes. Huh? Zip codes. Zip codes, excellent, right? Zip codes, amazing, right? So uh, what's Northridge? 909, I don't even know what it is. 90 something, 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 right? 
if you average zip codes, do you have do you live right in the middle of two zip codes if you average them? And that's your zip code. Does that make any sense? That's not how zip codes work. Right? You can't say, oh, you're 90210, so that's Beverly Hills. And you're 60645, that's Chicago. That's where I'm from originally. And if you average those two numbers, oh, okay, that puts you in Nebraska. That's not how zip codes work, right? There's no, there's no information that can be ascertained by doing math with the numbers. Therefore, it's not quantitative. So what is something that is quantitative? And you can use the same example that I've already done if you want. What's something that is quantitative? Uh, amount of cars in a parking lot. Cars in a parking lot. Right? Is there 17 cars in a parking lot and there's 16 cars in another parking lot? There's more in this one. Right? You can't say my zip code is bigger than yours. I'm better. Ha ha. It doesn't make sense. You can't compare zip codes. It doesn't make any sense. Right? Otherwise, I want to be 99999. Then I'm the best. I'm the highest. It doesn't, doesn't, there's nothing there. Prices, selling prices, right? That's quantitative. Age, quantitative. Height, quantitative. These are all quantitative. But just because it's a number does not make it quantitative. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? So far, so good? Yep. So as you can see here in this slide, breed, definitely categorical. No question about it. And um, selling price is certainly going to be quantitative. So question. <clears throat> In a study of commuting patterns of people in a large metropolitan area, respondents were asked to report the time they took to travel to their workplace on a specific day of the week. What is the individual? So don't shout out the answer. I want you to think about the answer. And then when we say what the answer is, you'll, you'll think to yourself, oh, I got that wrong. My understanding was not as good as it should have been. Or, hey, I got that right. I'm really, really smart. One of those two possibilities. So I want you to take 10 seconds 15 seconds and think about what your answer to this question is. Okay, that should be enough time. So who here believes the answer is A, travel time? B, a person. C, the day of the week. By the way, if you're writing, I can't see it. You see my screen. I can only hear you. And D, the city in which they live. Nobody has an answer to any of those four? I, I, I'm... B. Huh? B. Well, does anyone else agree? Is that one person who has the answer and no one else knows anything? B. Does anyone think it's anything but B? Anyone say A? Shout out, be proud. Any A's? Would, would mode of transportation count as A? Would it fall under um, A? No, a is, a is the travel time, which is a, a two hours, 40 minutes, right? It's not the mode of transportation. In fact, nowhere in the study does it specifically say or ask what the mode of transportation is, right? For a specific day of the week in a specific city, we're looking for the travel time for the people involved. Correct? So the individuals are the people. They are the ones who we are asking about. And what is the variable that we're after in this situation? A. Travel time. A, travel time. The, tra the travel, travel time. time. Is that quantitative or is that, oh, can I see chat here? Chat. It's, it's quantitative. Quantitative. It is quantitative. Good, travel time. It is quantitative, excellent, okay. Uh, so let's go to the next one. Uh, okay, so this is the answer. The correct answer is B. And uh, ah, so I already answered this one. I kind of divined what the question was going to be. I said, what is the variable of interest? And the variable of interest is A, travel time. Okay. So exploratory. So any questions so far? So far, so good? Questions? I have a question. Yes, will go ahead, be, please. Will you be sharing these slides afterwards? Yeah, I'll be posting them. And in general, I'll try to post them in advance, but I will be posting them on Canvas uh, uh, so you have them available to you. 
so that way I don't have to share the screen and I can, you know, you can have them, uh, you, you can have your own copies. Okay, thank you. Okay, an exploratory data analysis is the process of using statistical tools and ideas, which you don't have any yet, to be honest, you haven't learned any, to examine data in order to describe their main features. And we always begin by examining each variable by itself. So for example, suppose I was interested in how tall someone is when they are, let's say, three years old. So I go, you know, get a survey or, or take a poll of thousands of, you know, babies or, you know, uh, toddlers, whatever. And I'm curious how tall they are when they're three years old. Is that a quantitative variable or a categorical variable? Not everyone at once, please. Is that categorical or is that quantitative? Can you repeat the Isn't it quantitative? It is quantitative. That's correct. Quantitative. Right? How tall they are. That's height, right? That's quantitative. Then I might look at their parents and say, which of these kids have tall parents? And is there any correlation between the heights of the parents and the heights of the children? Is that something that a statistician might be interested in? Maybe a geneticist, someone who wants yeah. to look for the, for the connection between parents and children, correct? Yes. Sure. So, so there are times that you would look at data by itself. And then there's times that you're looking for relationships between variables. And we're gonna do both this semester, what's called univariate data analysis and bivariate data analysis. And if we went further, we might have multivariate data analysis. One variable, two variables, multiple variables. But you always start by each variable by itself, and then you move on to the relationships amongst them. Yeah. And when you look at each variable by itself, the first thing you wanna focus on is your graphical display. <clears throat> I can give you a list of 10,000 numbers and you can turn the pages and see all these numbers. Or I can give you one graph which summarizes the data. Which would you prefer to use for further analysis or for conclusions? Which one do you think is better to use for conclusions? The thousands or hundreds and hundreds of pages of numbers, one after the other, or the graph? The graph. Graph. Yeah. I mean, listen, I'm not saying there's not a time when you want to see the actual graph. Numbers, right? Yeah, the graph. I'm not saying there's not a time when you want to see the actual numbers, but a graph is a wonderful way of visualizing data because we are visual people. And after the fact, you can add numerical summaries or specific aspects of the data. What are some numerical summaries that you might use? We haven't studied them in depth yet or defined them, but can anyone come up with a good numerical summary of data? What will be a nice numerical summary of data? Those of you who have done stats before, a numerical summary. Populations of cities above 100,000. But that won't be a summary, that will be a list. When I mean summary, I mean here's all your data. I want to summarize it in a nice, compact, easy to read format. So like in the coin like example? I'm sorry? So like in the coin example they gave us, there's a 50, there's a 50 percent chance of landing tails. Uh, okay, so your, your, your summary there would be, I conclude that, in, that for this particular coin there's a 50 percent chance of landing tails. That would be a, a perfectly fine numeric. It wasn't what I was after, but it's perfectly valid. What I was after was something more like an average. All right, averages standard deviations, if you study them, medians, modes, these are things that you might have learned about in statistics before. These are ways of summarizing data without looking at the actual values. Because if I, huh? Say something? Because if I give you 10,000 numbers, sometimes it's very hard to really understand what's going on. But if I say the average is 5'8", right? You're looking for the average height of every American. Do I wanna give you 300 heights, sorry, 300 million heights? Or do I want to say the average is 5.8? Which is more useful to you? The average. Yeah. 
the average. Listen, I'm not saying there's not a time that you might care about the actual data, but for the most part, you want to do averages. And we'll study them for sure in a coming chapter. <clears throat> so the next one is called the distribution of a variable. This is very important. In fact, I've even used that word distribution before when I was showing you that applet without really defining what a distribution is. So let's do that right now. The distribution of a variable tells us what value it takes and how often it takes these values. Here's an example. You flip a coin. What is the variable when you flip a coin? What are the things that it might be? Heads or tails? Heads or tails. How often, if it's a fair coin, will it take heads and will it take tails? 50-50. 50-50, right? So the distribution in that case would be 50% heads, 50% tails. I give you the possibilities, the values that it can take, and I give you the likelihood of getting each of those values. If I was rolling a die, what would be the val a regular good old fashioned uh, 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 monopoly die? What are the values that it might take? One through six. One through six. And what is the likelihood of each of those one through six? One, one, one in six. One in, yeah, each one is one in six. What if I said, I'm interested in whether or not it's going to rain tomorrow. That'll be like a percentage. I'm sorry? That'll be like in percentage. Yeah, but I'm asking what are the possibilities? If I'm interested in whether it's going to rain in Northridge tomorrow, or better yet, over CSUN, so directly over CSUN, not only over CSUN, but directly over CSUN, and I'm curious, is it going to rain tomorrow? Then there's two options. There's two possibilities. It will rain or it will not rain, right? How do I assign a probability to those two values? How do I assign a number to the likelihood that it rains tomorrow or not rains tomorrow? What would I do in that case? Wouldn't it be 50-50 again? Well, so this is a very important point. And it's a nuance that's very important for you to realize immediately. Just because there's two options does not mean that those options are equally likely. Um, I'm going to go outside in a minute, and I'm going to look at the first person who drives by. And I'm curious whether that person is a male or a female, genetically not getting into the whole gender identity thing, but just straight up, keep it simple, uh, biologically male or female. Um, how many options are there for what I'm interested in, in, in looking at? Two. Two, Two options. options. Male or female. And roughly, roughly, what's the likelihood of each? 50-50. 50-50. I don't know the exact number of male drivers and female drivers in the world, but it should be pretty close to 50-50, correct? Now, let's say instead I say, I am interested in whether or not the driver is under the age of 100 or not under the age of 100. How many possibilities are there? Two. Two. Either he, he, either he or she is over 100 or he or she is under 100. Two possibilities. Are you going to claim it's 50-50? Nope. No. So just because there's two options does not mean they're equally likely. So is it equally likely that it's going to rain or not rain tomorrow at CESA? No. Probably no. not. Probably not. But you know what? Sometimes on the Weather Channel, they'll say something like, you have a 70, there's a 70% chance of rain tomorrow. How do they know that? Clouds. Huh? The clouds. Huh? Clouds, kind of, a little bit, not exactly. Wind, so wind patterns. Wind patterns, but what are they basing those wind patterns on? The likelihood of 
of it pushing a, a rain system over? Partially. There's no question about it. But that's not the actual way they determine it. You know how they determine it? Clouds. Par it's par really partially, but, but it's more in-depth. What they do is they look back at historical data at Northridge and find all the days that the weather pattern was similar to what was today. And then they check how many of those times did it rain the next day. And if it rained 70% of the time based upon how it looked today, then they say there's a 70% chance. Why? Because they're using historical data. Does that make sense? So yeah, they look at the clouds, they look at the patterns, they look at everything that's out there and they say, oh wait, this type of situation has occurred 1,387 times in the past. And of those 1,837 times, this is how many times it rained. And they use that to come up with a likelihood. Anyways, it's 540. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, you stop here. Class is over at 540. I hope today was not horrible. Uh, I see research. I don't even know what that question was because oh, well, a minute ago, so you were answering this last question. Um, but I hope today was not horrible. I will hopefully have the homework up and the whole system up tonight and send out an email to everyone. Uh, worst case, I would say tomorrow. And if there's any questions, stick around. Otherwise, I will see you guys on Thursday. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Just to confirm the odd. Okay, so someone answered. Great. Hi. Bye. Hey, uh, professor. Yes. yes. So, uh, you said um that like you you would offer some sort of assistance like if you if like the the program was too expensive. Well, I, I said I would see what I can do. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I can't promise anything, but I will. I can certainly see what I can do. So, are you someone who uh, is in a scenario where where that's a a, a, a distinct possibility? Well. You don't think yeah, it would definitely help me, yeah. Okay. Um, what are you doing for your other classes? Uh, I'm taking CD. Well, I, I've been... Huh? I, I haven't, like, really checked the, what, um, how much I'll be spending on, like, books or anything. But, like, I, I guess I, I just wanted to see if there isn't, like, any help, you know. It, if it was the if it was only the book, then I can certainly find ways of getting you copies that you wouldn't have to pay for. I don't know a way of getting around needing the program though. Okay. So what I would recommend is that you go online and see if they have a cost for just the program without the book. And if that's the case, you know, we can see about getting you, you know, someone can just take copies of the book and get them to you somehow or something. Yeah, but the program is like, is like non-negotiable, right? I, I have to, I have to be honest with you. I really don't see it as being a possibility. Oh, uh, okay. And no, Ryan, there's, there's no homework due this Thursday. Uh, you have at least a week to do the homework. So even if, even if it was up today, it won't be due until next Tuesday anyway. So, okay. so that means that we got until like Tuesday to pay for the, to get the program, right? Say again, please. So that means we, we have until like Tuesday to get the program, right? You have until, bye, bye Ryan. Um, no, the homework's not going to be due on Tuesday. Uh, uh, it, it, if we finish chapter one today, it would be Tuesday, but we're not, we didn't. So the earliest the homework would be due will be next Thursday. Okay. Um, so you would have until then before, before that's the earliest that you really have to worry about. Okay. All right. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, well, one more question. Yes. And I noticed that, um, I guess there's two different, like 140 classes. Mm -hmm. Back then it was just like one math 140. Yeah. But the other 140 is a different, a different type of 140. That's for, uh, business majors. 
business. Okay, just making oh, yeah, sure. You, you can't just pick one or the other. It's you got to go to that one. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. You're welcome. All right. All right. Thank you. 